Revelation chapter 4 this morning, and I want you to look at verse number 1. Verse number one, says, verse number one of chapter 4 says, after this. Now, the first thing we've got to ask ourselves is this. What does after this mean? Because <laughs> what, 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 what John is saying here is after what he was just revealed, That's right. this event now takes place. Yes. Now, that's important, okay? It says, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Yes. You say, how quickly is come up hither? Verse 2, and immediately. Yes. Let me tell you how Paul puts and immediately in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yep. In the twinkling of an eye is how he explains it there. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the middle of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes and before and behind, and the first beast was like a lion, the second like a calf, third beast had a face as a man, the fourth beast had the face of a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. There is the past, the present, and the future tense of the Lord's ministry. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to Him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne, and worship Him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, which comes that song, Crown Him with many crowns. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. That heavenly scene, by the way, continues into chapter 5, and only until we get to chapter 6 do we transform from a heavenly scene back to the earth. Now, it's important that I read all 11 verses to you because I wanted you to know that when the Lord said in verse number 1 of chapter 4, after this, behold, a door was opened in heaven, I want you to know that John was transported, that's the right word, that's right. from the Isle of Patmos, which is where this vision came from. Can we all agree? Amen. That's Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, if you want that. He was on the Isle of Patmos, and he was a prisoner for the word and testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. But what happened in chapter 4, he was transported in such a way, we would call that being caught up, yeah. raptured, yeah. taken out of here. And you say, where did he go? Was, it, was he just really just kind of in a trance? What happened? Verse 2 says, immediately he was in the Spirit, and he was in front of a throne, and he saw Jesus Christ, which is the clear description of who he was, on that throne. So he went from the Isle of Patmos up to a heavenly scene, but what I want you to understand is this all happened after this. Amen. Not before, That's right. but after chapter 2 and 3, That's right. after those churches were completed, yes. 
after this, a door was opened. Amen. And he was immediately in the Spirit, in the very presence of Almighty God. Amen. I am of the biblical belief that if you are part of Christ's body, if you're a born-again believer, you have been placed into Christ's body, seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. I am of the biblical belief that if you are part of Christ's body, the church, by being born again, then Christ will take His body out before a period of time, yet future, called the time of Jacob's trouble, or for more purposes today, the time of the great seven-year tribulation. The information that I'm going to give you this morning is not from a B-movie called Left Behind. Uh, if you're probably, you're like, oh, preacher pre preached on the rapture. I think we're just going to go get that, uh, that movie Left Behind with, uh, what's that guy that was in Con Air? And... What's his name? Kirk not Kirk Cameron. I'm not, I mean the, what was it? Nicholas Cage. I knew you'd know that. You have a picture of him in your room, don't you? But anyway, no, uh, yeah, exactly. So, so left behind, but Nicholas Cage. Listen, horrible movie. Horrible movie. Wasn't really good. It is not, by the way, this information is not coming to be, coming to you from a series of books written by Tim LaHaye called Left Behind. I, listen, he might have the principle right in those books, but you have to understand, don't think you're getting literal theology out of everything that book series is about because as a writer you take liberties. So he's going to kind of stretch things a little bit and make things do this and that, which might be extra biblical. Look up here. If you want to know about Left Behind, read this book. Amen. So I'm not going to give you anything from a B-movie called Left Behind, nor from a series of books written by Tim LaHaye. The information I'm going to give you is from the only infallible source on the face of the earth, Amen. your Bible. I'm going to say that again. It's the only infallible source of truth on the face of the earth. You say, well, wait a minute. Science says whatever science came up with is just validating what your Bible's already said. That's right. When Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue and realized the earth wasn't flat, he was just basically validating the fact the Bible said that he hangeth the earth upon nothing and that it is a sphere. That was stated well before Christopher Columbus was ever a twinkle in mom and dad's eyes. So our sermon this morning is entitled, The Rapture in Revelation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look at this message. And Father, I pray that, Lord, you would help us to, Lord, see the principle you are laying out here, Father. Help us to see the types. Help us to see the pictures. Help us to see what is going on here, Father. And I pray that you'd give us exactly what we need to know in Jesus Christ's name we ask it. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I gave you a little book last week. If you were not here last week, I want to make sure you get one of these little books right here called, Why I Am a Fundamentalist and You Should Be Too. You weren't here last week. I'll forget one right there. Don't read it during the sermon. But anyway, uh, <laughs> read it later. Read it later. But uh, that book right there talks, talks about the distinctions between fundamentalism, which are people that believe in the book of the Bible literally, and then evangelicalism, which, by the way, is a relatively modern movement. Yes. Modern evangelicalism, which some of you probably think you're a part of, is only about 1948. Right. You ought to do your study before you start saying things about yourself. But anyway, so 1948, evangelicalism started. And you say, what does this have to do with this sermon? Evangelicalism sought to basically water down the harshness of the fundamentalists. That's right. You know, the fundamentalists were too hardcore, and they were too over-literal with the Bible, you know, and they just were so upset that if you weren't pre-tribulational, then you couldn't do this, and you couldn't do that. So the evangelicals said, you know what, let's water that down, and let's just say that there's three basic agreeable positions. Now, before 1948, Jesus was coming back for his church. Amen. And then 1948, the evangelicals kind of said, you know what, we got to kind of temper this fire, you know, because there are a lot of people on both sides that like different views on eschatology. So what we'll do is say, you can believe pre, you can believe post, you can believe awe. Let's all just have a big, nice powwow debate. 
That was modern evangelicalism's way of trying to placate every group out there. Listen, let me tell you who I put behind this pulpit. People that believe the Bible literally. Amen. I will not put someone on the, behind this pulpit that doesn't take that book seriously, yeah. ever. You say, why? I am guarding this pulpit. Amen. I am making sure that whoever, whomever addresses you believes that Bible from cover to cover yeah. and believes it literally where it needs to be believed literally and believes it symbolically where it needs to be believed symbolically and believes it allegorically where it needs to be believed allegorically. But those latter two are actually smaller in comparison to the literal approach. Yes, right. okay. But what I want to sh show you this morning is this here in, in Revelation. Again, this message is still in flux. It is a bit fluid, but this is kind of what I'm going to be doing on the second evening. So if you don't want to watch that sermon, don't go online that evening. But if you want to watch it in its fullest, you might want to watch it. But let me, let me show you here in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Everyone say the next two words. After this... Now, what is this about? Look back at chapter 2, if you will. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, look at verse number 1. Under the angel of the church of what? All right. Drop down to verse number 8. Under the angel of the church in what? Good. Drop down, if you would, down to verse number 8, uh, tw verse 12, excuse me. Under the angel of the church in? Good. Drop down to verse 18. Under the angel of the church in? All right, drop over to chapter 3, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church in? Sardis. Verse 7 of chapter 3. Unto the angel of the church in? Philadelphia. Drop over to chapter 3, verse 14. Unto the angel of the church of the? Philadelphia. Stop. That's seven churches. That's right. Now let me give you a quick thing about those. Those are seven literal churches that existed in John's day. Not only were they seven literal churches, but they're also representative of seven church periods, That's right. beginning with Ephesus, the time of the apostles, yes. working your way down through 2,000 years of history, yes. ending in the Laodicean period. Amen. Now, if you think you're in, in the Philadelphian period, you're mistaken. Yeah. The Philadelphian period, Jesus said, I have set an open door and no man shutteth. And the Philadelphian period was roughly about 1500 to about 1800 and that was probably some of the best missionary endeavors the church has seen in years. Amen. The Philadelphian period was all about brotherly love. It was all about getting along, brotherly love, and it was all about making sure that that open door had some missionaries going through it. Amen. Now again, those seven churches are literal churches that existed in John's day, but they also represent seven church ages or periods of the past 2,000 years. We are in the seventh and final one. That's right. Come on. Come on. Laodicea. That's right. Which, by the way, has nothing good said about it. That's right. Which, by the way, God says... You're not hot, you're not cold, because you're lukewarm, yeah. I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's right. I added vomit, but you know what I mean. Listen, some of you don't like lukewarm water. Some of you, raise your hand if you don't like lukewarm water. Listen, some of you don't like it. I remember Wolf told me one time he didn't like it. He let me know in a whole week's long period he didn't like it. But never, when Wolf doesn't like something, he lets you know for a long time to make sure you know you don't like it. But anyway, but I like lukewarm water because I've got receding gum lines and I drink cold water. It's like, ah, but I like lukewarm water. Why? Because I can't afford dentistry. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, along with your checkbook. But anyway, nevertheless... When that final church period is done, chapter 4, verse 1, yeah. after this, right. then somebody's called up, yep. and they're in heaven. And then chapter 6 begins the first time through right. the great tribulation. I will have you note, John wasn't present. That's right. 
He was in the throne room amen. of God. Sure. Say amen. amen. I want you to notice, number one, the elements of the rapture. Revelation 4.1 must be speaking of the rapture because the verse contains all the elements yes. of the rapture. There's a trumpet. There's a voice. Yep. And there's someone being called up and called out. Yes. You say, where is that? Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 4. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Come on now, let's do a little Baptist ping pong this morning. Get those fingers going. If you're, already, if you're cold this morning because of the air conditioning, this will get you hot. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13. When you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, oh me. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a... Shout. With a of the archangel and with the and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Revelation 4.1 must be speaking of the rapture because the verse contains the elements of it. A trumpet, a voice, and someone being called up and out. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ rise first. Then it says, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them who the dead in Christ. So shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. You say, give me another one, preacher. I don't believe that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Come on, man. Let's get this thing going. You've got lunch happening here in about 30 minutes. It's already 10 minutes to 11, man. We haven't even started this sermon. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 50. When you're there, say amen. amen. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. All right, let's just stop real quick. Your body right now is composed of flesh and blood. Yes. That means that in order for you to get into heaven, you've got to change. Something about your biological and physiological composition has to change. Amen. It is going to change. Yes. Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a, everyone underline it, a mystery. You need to underline that. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. We shall not all sleep. That means we're not all going to die. Not everyone's going to die. That's right. But we shall all be changed. Now, not everyone may die, but everyone will change. That's right. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Yeah. All the elements are there, a trumpet, a voice, and someone being called up and out. Revelation 4.1 must be speaking of the rapture because of where it is placed. Yes. Go back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Now, I'm a big stickler on this, and you can have a debate with me all you want after this service, but you better know what you're talking about before you start blowing hot air at me. That's right. All right? I believe that every verse, every placement of word is predetermined by God, I just became a Calvinist. Amen. I believe every jot, every tittle, every placement, where it is in the chapter break, everything is of God. Amen. Every bit of it. You say, well, bless God, didn't you know, preacher, that back in the originals they didn't? I know that, dork. I know that. But God did something with what we have that's better than that. I've got a Bible. I don't have originals. I've got a Bible right now in my possession. I don't have originals. By the way, if God liked those originals, He'd have kept them around. But nevertheless, let's not go there right now. Revelation 4.1 must be speaking of the rapture because of where it is placed. That is, it is placed after two chapters representing churches culminating with the seventh and final church, the Laodicea, That's right. and the placement of Revelation 4.1 comes before the chapters that speak of the Great Tribulation, right. which are chapters 6 through 19, respectively. Amen. Now, you see, oh, oh, preacher, come on, you're making too much of that. No, you're not making much of your Bible. Amen. You ought to see that. You say, well, the commentaries don't make those big. The commentaries don't see other than what the guy before him saw. That's right. <laughs> you understand that? Yes. 
Do you understand there's nothing new under the sun, man? You, you folks out there that rely on commentaries and say, well, what does brother so-and-so say? I don't, give, I don't care what he says. I don't care what he says. I want to know what this says. Now, every once in a while, I will be curious as to what brother so-and-so says. And when brother so-and-so aligns with the Bible, I say, amen, high five. When he doesn't line with the Bible, I scrap him. That's right. And that's how you should be too. You should give the benefit of the doubt to the Bible, not to the scholar. That's right. Revelation 4.1 must be speaking of the rapture because of where it is placed. Coming after the seventh church, but before a description of the seven-year tribulation. Is that coincidence or is that planned? Let me give you another one. The rapture and the church both are both spoken of and called mysteries. Now you say, why is that important, preacher? I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go back there. Now you've got to look at this and, and just notice the words, man. The words should offer the consolation here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look at verse number 51. Behold, who's the eye? That is Paul in the letter. Behold, I, Paul, show you a mystery. Okay, stop. This means that whatever he was given here wasn't known in a very detailed way before it was known to him. So that's why in the Old Testament, even though I can show you typology after typology of the rapture, it's not like they were looking for being caught up. Every Old Testament Jew was looking for an earthly kingdom where Jesus would sit on a throne and whip up on his enemies. They weren't looking to being called out of here. They weren't looking for that. So when God called Paul, he showed Paul several mysteries. Yes. You say, what's a mystery? Go over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. See how this, this message is forming? I don't even have some of these in my notes, but it's forming right now before our very eyes. Amen. Yes. Ephesians chapter 3. Hey, you say, when have you, have you deviated from your notes? 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, what? He didn't say Jews. He says, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Now, this is not a period called the dispensation of grace. Now, I know that dispensationalists like to call this the dispensation of grace. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I don't think that's the proper usage of this word. It just simply means that God dispensed grace that was uniquely graceful to Paul and is now dispensing it to the Gentiles and including them on something. Look at verse 3. How that by revelation. Can everyone say revelation? revelation? The word revelation means that God revealed something to him that was not known prior to him. Yeah. How that by revelation he, God, made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Stop! Yeah. The mystery of 1 Corinthians 15, the mystery that is being described here, and the other mysteries that were only given to Paul to then give to the New Testament church were not known before this. That's right. It is important for you to get that. When you hear people say, well, show me that rapture in that Old Testament, I can show you typology, I can show you pictures, I can show you Enoch. Yeah, amen. A man that would... Never die. That's right. yeah. That was caught up before a cataclysmic global event. Yeah. Yeah, I can show you all that. I can show you all that. I can show you some things in Isaiah and show you some things in Song of Solomon. And I can show you some things in Ezekiel. And I can show you some things in the minor prophets that will boggle your mind. That's right. But the Jews weren't looking at it that way. That's you right. say, why? 
It wasn't revealed until post-cross to Paul specifically, then Paul to the New Testament church. And if we are worth our salt as New Testament Christians, we're supposed to be revealing those mysteries right now. Amen. You see, those who just want a clear-cut verse on the rapture of the church before the Great Tribulation have to understand that the rapture is still mystery in part. That's right. Yeah. Furthermore, the church is also called a mystery. Yes. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 31. Yep. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Yes. Thomas and Tiff know that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> verse number 32. This is a great mystery. Amen. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Amen. So the church is also called a mystery. Now I want you to think about this. Just as a man doesn't discuss the private matters of his marriage with everyone, That's right. Christ doesn't lay the doctrines out of the rapture in an open face for all to see, except for those that are His. That's right. That's right. I want you to listen to that. If you're intimately involved with Him, and I'm not talking about that in some sexual way, I'm talking about an intimacy and relationship. Yes, He'll show you some things. That's right. But if you're outside of that context, then you'll say things like, well, there's three acceptable views. <laughs> That's right. You know why? Because you don't even know what you are. Amen. That's why you say that. I know precisely what I am. Amen. And that's why some folks don't like this church. How can that pastor be so confident? Amen. <laughs> However, here's the important thing for you to know. God lays out just enough for us to know that it will happen before His wrath is poured out on the whole world. Amen. Now I want you to think about two things. I'm not even anywhere near this. I want you to think about two things. Do you remember when Paul was breathing threatenings yeah. to the church as he was on the road to Damascus. Yes. Yeah. And Jesus got so incensed yeah. that Saul, who would later become Paul, would wreak havoc to his body. Yes. Yeah. Let me say that again. Come on up. Catch it. Catch it. God was so incensed that Saul was wreaking havoc and causing wrath yes. on his body. Yes. If he got incensed at that, why would he put his body through what it wasn't planned to go through? That's right. right. Interesting. And then some people would say, well, Matthew, 20, Matthew 25, you got five foolish, you got five, you got five foolish and five wise. And they like to talk about a split rapture. Because that's within evangelicalism, you know, we have to accept that. No, no. Most of evangelicalism don't even know how to doctrinally apply Matthew 25. I mean, they get so messed up. It's It's horrible. But you say, all right, preacher, why do you bring up Revelation 4.1? Go back there, and I'm going to try to wrap this up in 16 minutes. <laughs> I'm laughing for you, rather with you. Look at John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet. Now, you say, who was the guy that got called up? Look at Revelation 1, verse 9. Revelation 1, verse 9. Say the next two words. I, John. I, John. So who's Revelation 4, 1? That's John. That's John. Now, I find it very interesting. And you're not going to hear this anywhere else. I promise you, if you hear it somewhere else, tell me. And I will say I'm wrong. I find it very interesting that out of all the apostles that Christ chose to reveal the end times to, that Christ chose John the Beloved. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. He didn't give it to Peter. He, didn't, he did give some things to Peter. He didn't give all things to, everything to Paul, although Paul had some things. But man, when it came to the entire panoply of the unfolding of everything, right. he gave it to John. Yep. I wonder why. I wonder why the commentaries don't muse on that. I wonder why the commentaries don't think, huh, why out of all the apostles did God give John the Beloved this revelation? Why call him up? Because he must typify somebody. Let me say that again. John must be, by himself, a type of a bunch of people. Yes. Let me give you a few things about John that's interesting. Number one, John's name means full of grace. Yes. Interesting. Now listen, there's been grace from Genesis 3... Yeah. to Revelation 22. Yes. Don't let the hyper-dispensationalists tell you there's only special grace now. No, no, there's grace in the Old Testament. Amen. Plenty of it. Uh, David did not get killed for the sin of murder and adultery. That's right. right. By the way, God didn't let him off the hook, no. <laughs> but the law prescribed death. Yeah. That's grace. The children of Israel who grew up in the wilderness, who did not get circumcised the eighth day, who went over the river Jordan with Joshua yeah. after Moses had departed, guess what? They had not been circumcised. In their mid-twenties, they got circumcised. That's right. You say, what happened? Grace. Amen. All kinds of grace. What about, what about Adam and Eve messing it up, Garden, Garden of Eden? Take of the tree, fig leaves of unrighteousness, cover up their unrighteousness. They knew they couldn't do that. God says that's not going to do. Take those things off. I'll kill something for you and cover you with it. That's right. You say, what's that? That's grace. Amen. There's grace all through it. The fact that Moses was allowed to go on top of Pithgah to look at the promised land after he had broken a clear command of God to speak and not strike the rock. Amen. The fact that he was just allowed to go and peek over was grace. Amen. There's grace all through it. So don't let those hyper-dispensationalists say, there was no grace until uniquely the New Testament. But I will say this. We are living in a time of abundance of grace. Amen. Amen. Probably more so than a lot of folks never experienced, but we got a lot of grace. John's name, interestingly enough, means full of grace. Let me give you another one. John is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's right. Now that is interesting. Now I don't, have, I, don't have, I don't have time to give you all these verses, but if you want to write it down, John 13, 23, John 20, verse 2, John 21, verse 7, and John 21, verse 20. Every one of those editorializes before John's name is mentioned, saying, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's right. Why isolate him? I mean, think about this. Obviously, Jesus Christ loved all of his disciples. Can we all get, can we get an amen there? Amen. He loved all of his disciples, but this indicates a special love for John, like a love that Christ would have for a bride. Amen. Interesting. I love you, but not like I love Rita. That's right. But I love you, but not like I love Rita. That's right. I love Rita, but not like I love my Savior. Amen. Amen. And there's nothing disrespectful about that. That's right. Amen. John is specifically, by the Holy Ghost, called out as the one whom Jesus loved. Amen. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me give you another one. Do you know who sat closest to Jesus at the Last Supper? Do you know who not only sat closest but laid his head on Christ's bosom? John 13, 23. As they were all sitting there about to have that Last Supper before the Lord is about to be crucified, John the Beloved lays his head on the breast of our Savior. You say, why is that so significant, preacher? 
Well, it's almost like, it's almost like a bride loving the groom. Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 5. You don't need to turn there. Song of Solomon 8, verse 5 says this. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning upon his beloved? Amen. Interesting. Let me give you another one. John had more personal assurance than the other disciples at that Last Supper. You say, what do you mean? Go to John chapter 13, verse 25. I just, if you never notice this, then you might find this interesting. This is going to take a little time to develop here because if you don't know what we know at this church, then, then, you, then it'll take a little time. John chapter 13, verse 25. Look at verse 25. John 13, verse 25. You there? Say amen. amen. He, John, then lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Stop. Stop. Look up here. Every disciple said, is it I? That's right. Every one of them. John is denoted in this particular book as saying, who is it? That's right. As if to suggest, I know it ain't me. Almost like he had personal assurance of security. Let me say that again. Almost as if he knows something that's going to happen when the Spirit of God indwells a person and seals that person and gives them confidence to know, I would never do this to my Savior. That's right. Interesting. But the other 11, well, Judas, of course, he, of course, lets it out of the bag, right? Yeah. Look over in Matthew. It's me, right? Yeah. Thou hast said. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's another message for another day. But only John asks, who is it? This demonstrates to me that John, as a type of the church, the New Testament church, has a personal confidence and assurance that can only come from a permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost, unlike any other group that precedes the church. Are we, are we following that? You see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people and then left. Came upon people, then left. Came upon people, then left. Empowered somebody, then left. In the New Testament, after the cross, he comes in and stays. Who is it? Not, is it I? Interesting. You say, I don't think that's a big deal. Oh, I think it is. I think it's interesting and significant that that would be included. Let me give you another one. Go to John chapter 21. We'll end here. <laughs> kind of. John chapter 21, verse 22. Ah. This is coming off of the Lord asking Peter, Lovest thou me? Of course, Peter says, Of course I love you. And he says, Feed my sheep and all that. Now I want you to drop over to Ah, let's start at verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. In other words, you, you, ha you were independent. You could do what you wanted to do. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. In other words, some of you are experiencing that right now. Amen. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. The first half of the verse is young. The second half is you getting older. Verse 19. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yes. Everyone know who that is? John. Which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Right. Let me say that again. Look at verse 22. Yes. If I will that John tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Let me translate it for the UNIV people. If I, Jesus, wants John to see me come the second time, yes. 
What is that to you, Peter? Just follow me. That's right. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die, referring to John. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know what his testimony is true. John would see Christ's coming. That's right. You say, what do you mean he did? John got taken from Patmos, That's right, right. was transported into the heavenlies, and was given a full spectrum 4D IMAX visual That's right. of what the future would look like. And he saw Christ coming down on a white horse Amen. in Revelation 19, where the word of God is a sword proceeding out of his mouth, smiting the nations. Evidently, he saw it. Oh, yeah. While John did not see Christ's literal second coming, which we will be a part of, John did see it in a vision via the entire book of Revelation. In this sense, John did tarry until Jesus came, which is exactly what the church does. That's right. Interesting. John is a picture or a type of the church. Don't you get it? Don't you see why the Lord added those little nuances and those little extra editorialized comments about Him? He's trying to get you to connect the dots and try to get you to see it beyond the theology that you were taught. Hello? Because some of you have a theology that says, it just couldn't be like that. I'm telling you that you need to test that theology in light of the Scripture. And when you come with the right conclusions on end times, God will show you things, man, that are just amazing. Amen. But if you, come to, if you come to them and say, well, I believe it's all millennialism. I don't believe there'll be any millennium. I, I believe we're in it right now. Then you will basically know A, B, C, and that's it. Yes. You'll be writing on a prophetic chalkboard the rest of your life. While the other people, Christ's bride, those that are leaning on his breast, those that are beloved, get in on some things. By the way, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, verse 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, if that's true, then we're not going through the hell that Jesus is putting this earth through. Amen. You say, is that the only way you prove that? That's one of several. That's right. I mean several. There are so many, the eyes will boggle. To prove to you that Christ loves, nourishes, cares, for his body. Here's the question. You going up? You going up? If you're saved, by believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did for you, then you will, unless you die first. Amen. But even then, you're going to go up. Yes. Because the dead in Christ go up first. That's right. Then we which are alive meet you in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Now, I don't have that thing all <laughs> fleshed out. It's still a little fluid. I deviated from my notes about 15 times. But I think that should help some people. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to go on different routes. Of course, I have another two opportunities to preach. But I'm going to be preaching to about 100 folks sitting in the congregation, but there will be about six to 10,000 on, right, online. online. If six or 10,000 people, which, by the way, most of them are all where I am. Yeah. But if I can convince one or two of those guys what the Bible says, yeah. and they're believers... Boy, 
What a load off their shoulders. Amen. What a load. What a load.